our culture right now is all about output, yeah. right? You got to be posting on social media, the, the marketing plans. You have to be doing three to five posts every, every day. Something, you know, and it's, and it's this pressure to always be talking, to always be making a point. And I think this is so important. It says something, honestly, the Lord's been working in my own heart as well, is I get really nervous when I find myself outputting more than I'm inputting, if I'm talking more than I'm learning or if I'm you know, speaking on an issue more than I'm taking time to learn something new. Hi, I'm Kirk Cameron, and thank you for joining us for a special digital exclusive with American singer-songwriter, Alyssa Childers. Thanks for joining me today. Great to be here. So you've got this great new book out, Live Your Truth and Other Lies, exposing popular deceptions that make us anxious, exhausted, and self-obsessed. You're exactly right here. Young people today, and all of us are living with more anxiety, more worry, more depression, more mental illness, it seems, than ever before. Yeah. Well, wh why do you think this is? Well, the statistics have bo borne this out, especially among Gen Z. We're seeing skyrocketing levels of depression, anxiety, as you mentioned. Um, Gen Z is experiencing a lot of this inner turmoil. And I think that at least one major component of that is that everything in our culture, especially media, uh, streaming platforms, books, all the things that are aimed really at our kids at Gen Z is telling them you're perfect just as you are. All you need to do is dig down inside mm. yourself mm. and discover your inner truth or your inner goddess, as I think you said before. And that is something that they're inundated with. But the problem is, it's like we have kids in kindergarten who are being told you have to figure out who you are and you just have to use the tools you find inside of yourself. Well, of course that's gonna to lead to anxiety. And the good news is that we don't have to be on that culture train. We can get off that train and we can go to scripture and know who we are, which is people made in the image and likeness of God. And because of that, I think we have to start there. Everyone has dignity. We have value and worth because we've been made in the image of God. But a lot of people skip over the Genesis three part, mm. which is the but, but, <laughs> All of us have that image distorted. It doesn't go away, but it's distorted by sin. And there's a great Old Testament scholar, Jay Sklar, and he says, sin is an acid that mars and destroys everything it touches. Mm. So wouldn't we want to get the message out to people? If there's something that's destroying you, there's something that's seeking your harm and your destruction, and we had the answer, wouldn't we wanna share what that is? And so when it comes to these popular deceptions that are aimed at our kids that are making them anxious and mm. making them exhausted because it's making them totally focused on themselves, which is not why we were created. It leads to all of those things, but getting off that train and just planting our truths in the eternal truths of God's word is, is going to bring peace. In fact, I tell audiences this, especially young people, a lot of young people feel like they have to get on social media to find out what they're supposed to think today. And mm. that's exhausting. Talk mm. about exhausting wow. because that changes every five minutes and people are deleting old tweets that are now gonna get them canceled. But everybody thought that 10 minutes ago and now it's changed. Isn't it more life-giving to you? Doesn't it seem like it would give you more peace to just plant your feet in God's word that never changes? Sometimes culture is gonna be okay with some of it. Sometimes they're not, but you're always gonna be on the side of truth if you're on the side of God's word. Mm. Never changes. Isn't that a message of relief rather than a message of bondage. Yes, absolutely. One of the, one of the things that we experience in our culture a lot today is uh, known as FOMO, fear of missing out. Yeah. Well, how does that monkey with our minds? Yeah, FOMO. So that's, that's one of those hashtags, kind of like the YOLO hashtag, you only right. live once. Yeah, everybody has fear of missing out, right? You know, as an introvert, I really understand this. I get invited to a party and I, yes, I want to go. And then the party comes, I'm like, I don't really want to go, but I, I have fear of missing out of what that is. But I think in, in the cultural aspect, that's applied broadly. So fear of missing out of sowing my wild oats or missing this party or knowing what it's like to be drunk or, or identify as a different gender. I think that can really speak volumes to Gen Z. But we know that we serve a God that knows the end from the beginning. He knows all. And so he's gonna tell us the truth about what is best for us. And so I think maybe we can brush some of that FOMO aside when we know that God is sovereign and he's all knowing. He knows everything that will ever happen. And yet he has said, here is the best way for you to live. Here's what's gonna make you thrive. Here's what's gonna give you the most joy. And so uh, my hope would be that people would just say, okay, let's just do that. And rather than having to do all this other stuff, the fear of missing out, but you're not gonna miss out on anything that's going to give you value and hope 
by turning your back on what God says is good or true. Mm. With so many worldviews out there, with so many messages coming at us, how, how can you, how do you pin down the truth today? Mm. With so many people speaking for God, with so many people defining truth, how do you know what's actually true, especially about things that aren't specifically mentioned in the Bible? Right. Like whether or not you can pick a pronoun. Right. Uh, how do you develop a biblical worldview that anchors me in truth? Yeah. Well, I think the Bible presupposes pronouns. So I actually do think that the scripture does speak to that because from Genesis to Revelation, when the Bible talks about the creation and creating human beings, he literally says male and female, he created them. Them is a pronoun for male and female, multiple plural. It's a plural pronoun, right? God uses pronouns for himself. He uses she for women and he for men. So I think this is something that is in scripture. But as far as finding the truth, like what this religion versus that religion, these things are testable. We can test these things in reality. For example, just take the, the, uh, the Big Bang co cosmology that scientists have pretty much, uh, they have a consensus that the universe exploded into existence at a finite point in time, uh, space, time, and matter all exploding into existence out of nothing. And so, you know, this has, and this isn't about the age of the earth. This isn't about any of that. I'm just talking about what science is saying. Well, mm. read the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That sure sounds like the universe exploding into existence out of absolutely nothing. And so you can test these things and ask the atheist or the unbeliever, okay, so if something exploded into existence out of nothing, either nothing caused it or something caused it. Pick your miracle. And to me, it's a lot more reasonable to conclude that something caused the universe to explode into existence out of nothing because things don't begin to exist without a cause. That's the law of causation. Everything that begins to exist must have a cause. So therefore we know that the universe had to have a cause. So you're in the supernatural already, just from the very beginning. And then you can test these things in reality. There are archeology, uh, archeological finds. Uh, there's historical reliability markers that historians use. The Bible stands up to all of these things. And so I think that these are things you can test. You can test the manuscript copying tradition. Do we have an accurate copy of what was written? Does it tell the truth? And you can do this on all the religious uh, documents that we have out there. And the New Testament stands uh, tall atop all, all of the other mm. classical literatures, even just in the copying tradition. So I think these are things that, that are testable. We can test them. Uh, but ultimately, at some point, you have to put your faith in something. And everybody does this every day. Uh, when you sat down in the chair, you had faith that the chair would hold you. That's a reasonable faith because that's what the chair is there for. And it's probably been constructed properly. You have reasons to believe that it's, it's a good decision. And it's to been holding down. me up for an hour. It's so been holding, I continue yeah, so to this, trust in it. That's right. You continue to trust in it. And I think biblical faith is very similar. Like, yes, you do want to plant your feet at a certain point based on good reasons, but there are good reasons out there. Yeah, such a good point. Um, you say, uh, you use the word in your book here, exhausted. Jesus talked a lot about rest, about finding rest. He would go off to a lonely place. He would be with God. He would take a break. Uh, I, I, I don't know all, all, all of it, but, but where do we find rest mm. in a culture like this that is so exhausting? Uh, well, I think that it is incredibly important. I'm, this is something I've been thinking a lot about because I, I, I have a very active mind and I like to be thinking about five things at the same time and doing, I'm multitasker, I like doing a lot of things at the same time. But the Lord's really been impressing upon my heart how important it is for me to take time that is absolutely solely dedicated to silence and being, and I don't mean silence like not making any sound at all, but just tuning out all the noise, mm. turning off the phone, turning off the computer, pulling out a paper Bible. For me, it's even not even looking at the Bible on my phone, but pulling out a paper Bible, just removing all of those distractions, even if it's just 30 minutes in the morning before my kids get up, just to be with the Lord, tune out all the distraction. And for me, that's been bringing me a lot of rest. And that is even helped my prayer life as the Lord will bring things to my mind to write down people to pray for. And it's just this moment where you can breathe. And I think, especially in this culture, we have to really be intentional about making that happen because yeah. it's not going to happen. If you just get out of bed and you start doing your day, you're probably not going to at 2 p.m. say, okay, this is the moment I'm gonna take some silence. So mm -mm. I think what, you know, everybody has to figure out where that's gonna work into their own schedule. But I think taking sabbaticals, taking time where you're not working, however that might be, 
I think this is why the Sabbath principle is so important in, in scripture to take at least that one day where you just dedicate that to worship to the Lord and try to get away from the distractions and the striving and the working. It's a very, very important, I mean, it's even rooted in creation and God rested, right? Mm. It's something that he models for us. So it's an important thing that we have to be aware of. Yeah. I see a parallel there with, with the scriptures that say that we're to be slow to speak and quick to listen, mm. right? Not so much output, uh, listen more, learn more. And I think that's what resting is. Instead of just being the, ger- the, the, the gerbil on the, on, on the wheel yeah. um, where you're generating stuff, how about we take a step back and we start to receive from God? And, and one of the people that I learned that from is my daughter. She re- loves to write poetry oh, wow. and she loves to create artwork. And in her poem, she often just mentions the beauty of sitting still, mm. resting, and just watching what God has done rather than us trying to do so much and create so much. And the other day I was sitting in the backyard and I was on the porch and um, just just talking about gratitude. And uh, I was given a reason for gratitude like that when within five seconds, it went from just a couple of little raindrops to the trees bending over backwards here in Tennessee and these gale force winds, the rain was now moving horizontally. It sent me into the house. I looked out the window and there was a flash of lightning that must have struck, I don't know, within a couple hundred yards of the house that was millions of watts of power. Mm. And I learned more in that little prayer session Bible study than I would by just working so hard, thinking so much, coming up with arguments against things. That just reminded me that like, you are God and I am not. You are powerful and I am not. You know, I'm I'm, I'm strong when I'm I'm weak and I'm relying upon you. And those moments of just resting, watching, observing, learning, taking in what God has done, I think actually empowers us and uh, it, it sharpens the ax and re-energizes us so that we can actually be more efficient when we go out to do stuff. Oh, this is so important because our culture right now is all about output, yeah. right? You gotta be posting on social media, the, the marketing plans, you have to be doing three to five posts every, every day. Something, you know, and it's, and it's this pressure to always be talking, to always be making a point. And I think this is so important. It says something, honestly, the Lord's been working in my own heart as well, is I get really nervous when I find myself outputting more than I'm inputting, if I'm talking more than I'm learning, or if I'm you know, speaking on an issue more than I'm taking time to learn something new. And so this is why I, take, I, I continue to take classes in seminary. It's why I try to carve out that time with the Lord. And even sometimes even saying, okay, we're taking the month off of social media. You're not gonna see any posts from this account. It's what we do in December. You're not gonna see any posts from this account in the whole month of December, because we're just gonna take time away, be with our families, receive from the Lord and not have to output. And I think that is very countercultural because our culture pressures us to always be just putting out content and putting out opinions and putting out this or that. And we, we have to actually be really intentional about that now because it's not easy. What, what advice could you give to someone who's, who's listening, us to right, listening to us right now and, and, and they're saying, you know, I've, that's me. Um, I suffer from fear of missing out. Um, I have social media addiction. I check my phone in the middle of the night. I check it in the morning and the evening. Um, I, I really don't have time to, to sit and, and listen to God. There's just too, too much to get done, too many texts to, to respond to. Uh, how could they get started? Mm. What's, a, what's a simple practice for learning how to, to rest? What comes to my mind first would be to just maybe come up, pray about coming up with two or three really strong boundaries. Like I have some of those. I, I, there are certain uh, inputs where people can message through different social media channels that I have. And one of my boundaries, I don't read those. And we even have a thing that, that uh, an automatic response that says we get a large volume of messages through here. I can't read them all. I apologize. But, you know, um, I, I have people that'll sift through some of that sometimes. But that's just a boundary that I have because I know that if I were to try to read every message that came in, that would definitely take time away from my kids and my husband and my family. So finding out what those boundaries are for you, and then mm. you can let people know those boundaries. Like you can have an automatic reply saying, I, I'm not able to respond to messages at this account. Um, what Maybe. if they don't have a big platform like you and it's just a, a, just a normal person who, yeah. what are some kind of everyday boundaries for everyday people? Like, hey, I'm only gonna check my email between these hours right. or I'm, you That's know, a I, great practice is emails, is maybe just checking emails in the morning and then again at night or maybe just once a day. Pick a time once a day and you can even have that in your sign off on your email that automatically goes like, I check my emails at this time. So 
you know, be prepared well, to wait. Idea. Yeah, you can yeah. actually put that stuff in there so that you're not worried that somebody has an expectation that you're not meeting. But I think too, one thing that's really helpful in those areas is to have some accountability with somebody else. Where, because it's easy to say, well, I'm only going to check my email this at this time and at this time, or maybe just this one time. And then we sneak it in because nobody's looking and, you know, we don't have that accountability. But if we yeah. have somebody who we're talking with and saying, okay, how'd you do this week with that? How was Monday? How was Tuesday? And then we can help each other and walk with, with one another in those boundaries that we're creating for ourselves. This has been so great. It's so easy to just slip into these cultural phrases because everybody's saying them. And then because they're nice people and some of them are even Christians, we start to think that this must be what's in the Bible. Yeah. And we've got to be really careful about that because God's ways are always the right ways because of the true ways.